By the 16th century, the laws of planetary motion were being challenged by new thinking, largely led by Nicholas Copernicus and those who followed him. So basically, Nicholas Copernicus offered an alternative to Ptolemy's geocentric universe, namely that the sun was at the center of the cosmos and that the planets, in turn, orbited the sun. So the resolution to the geocentric versus heliocentric debate would largely be undertaken by Tycho Brahe. This was the world's leading astronomer. He was a nobleman from Denmark, and his ideas basically merged some of the mathematical benefits of Copernicus's system with the philosophical benefits of the Ptolemaic system. Namely, the moon orbits the earth, and the sun carries the planets in its orbit around the earth. So it was a kind of a hybrid universe, a geocentric model with a heliocentric component to it. Now, Tycho was very well connected. The king of Denmark uh, allowed him to use property uh, among the kingdom, not the least of which was a small island called Ven. On this island was an old fortress, and Ptolemy converted this fortress into a palace he named Uraniborg. So this was a palace where he could conduct his astronomical observations using the finest equipment available. And in those days, the finest equipment available largely meant things like sextants and geodesics and other geometrical line-of-sight astronomical tools. This was before the age of the telescope that would be ushered in by Galileo. Nevertheless, Tycho was able to capture a tremendous amount of highly detailed data. And now he wanted to test his idea to see if his universe was in fact the correct model. The problem, though, is that for all of Tycho's capabilities as an astronomer, he really did not have the mathematical chops to analyze the data. Later in life, he would meet Johann Kepler and invite him to come work for him. Now, Kepler was an astronomer and mathematician, and he had his own ideas of how the universe might be ordered. Like Copernicus, he believed that the sun would be at the center of the cosmos. However, he thought that he could determine the arrangement and orbital periods and locations of the planets by nesting the so-called platonic solids. These are the solids that all have equal sides. Now, he didn't seriously believe that there were geometric objects in space, but rather the arrangement of these geometric objects would reveal the locations of the planet's orbits. But lacking the data, he had no way to test this until Tycho Brahe came a calling. So Kepler went to work for Tycho, but the problem was that he could not get all of Tycho's data. You see, Tycho was a little bit of an insecure guy, and he didn't want to just give this uh, young mathematician all of his data. So Kepler worked with what little scraps of data Tycho would pass along. And this frustrated Kepler, and he was about ready to quit and give up and go back home when, luckily for Kepler, Tycho died. And now Kepler had the opportunity to finally test his idea to see if it was correct. It wasn't. In fact, he could not get the planets to fit the perfectly circular orbits that his model required. The data just would not agree with his beliefs, and so he discarded his beliefs. And he came out with the laws of planetary motion. And it's the so-called Keplerian laws that we're going to discuss now. Kepler's first law is this. Rather than a circle, a planet orbits the sun in an ellipse with the sun at one focus and nothing at the second focus. Now, let's just describe ellipses for a moment. And to do that, let's talk briefly about circles. So if we took a nail and we hammer it into the wall and we take our pencil and a piece of string and then just do what comes naturally, well, of course, you get a circle. So a circle has a center, and in most of our dealings with circles, we're familiar with the diameter of a circle, but in mathematics, we only concern ourselves with one half of the, di of the diameter. We call this the radius. An ellipse, on the other hand, is made by hammering two nails into the wall, taking your pencil and the piece of string, and then just doing what comes naturally to generate an ellipse. So the nail holes, you might say, are each called a focus, or foci for plural. 
we can then go across the widest part of the ellipse, giving us something called the major axis. But just as we learned with radius versus a diameter, we only concern ourselves with half of the major axis, and therefore we call this the semi-major axis. And since we're going to be using semi-major axis later on, we're going to substitute the lowercase letter a to refer to semi-major axis. Now there's another property of an ellipse called the eccentricity. The eccentricity is a measure of an ellipse's shape. So for example, this particular ellipse has an eccentricity of 0.35. The value of the eccentricity is always going to be at least zero and less than one. And there's no unit associated with this. It's not measured in feet or kilometers or astronomical units. Rather, it's just a unitless number. So as long as it's less than one all the way down to zero, you have an ellipse. That means that if we bring the two foci together to form a center, the eccentricity falls to zero. Or we could spread the two foci apart, and in this case, we can see a fairly flattened football-shaped ellipse with an eccentricity of 0.7. To calculate the eccentricity, it's really quite simple. What you can do is take half of the major axis, that is the semi-major axis, and then you can go from the geometric center to either of the two foci. We call that lowercase letter c, and then just take their ratio to give the eccentricity. So, to recap, Kepler's first law states that planets orbit the Sun in an ellipse, with the Sun at one focus and nothing at the second. Now, when it comes to planets orbiting the Sun, there are two locations we should point out. First is the closest position to the Sun, that's called perihelion, and the most distant position from the Sun is called aphelion. So you'll be hearing me refer to perihelion and aphelion a lot, and that's just ways of describing the closest and farthest positions from the sun. So Kepler's second law states that if we allowed a planet to come past the sun, let's say in this case near perihelion over a 10-day period, and if we were to look at that same planet towards aphelion over a same 10-day period, so in other words, the time intervals are going to be equal to each other. Now, if we do what comes naturally and play connect the dots between the perihelion pass, uh, we can get some kind of an area. And we can do the same thing with the aphelion pass. And if we measured the area of these two triangles, it turns out that both of these areas are equal. Therefore, Kepler's second law states that a planet sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals as it orbits the sun. And there's another implication here. In order for the perihelion interval to equal the aphelion interval, the rate at which the planet is moving during perihelion must be faster. And the rate which the planet moves during aphelion must be slower. So a planet speeds up as it approaches perihelion and slows down as it approaches aphelion and repeats the cycle over. Kepler's third law showed us a relationship between the orbital period of a planet when measured in years and its semi-major axis when measured in astronomical units. And it turns out that the relationship is pretty simple. The square of the planet's orbital period is proportional to the cube of its semi-major axis. In other words, the orbital period squared is equal to its semi-major axis cubed. To show you an example of this, let's take a look at, well, the very simplest. We're just going to use our own planet Earth. So we know its orbital period is exactly one year. Its semi-major axis is exactly one astronomical unit. Okay, so one squared is equal to one, and its semi-major axis cubed is also equal to one, so p squared equals a cubed. That is to say, they both equal one. Not very exciting, but at least you can see the logic here. Now let's use a more distant planet in this example. We'll go ahead and use Jupiter. It has an orbital period of just under 12 years, and it has a semi-major axis of 5.2 astronomical units. So if we take its orbital period, 11.9 years, and square it, we get 141. And if we take its semi-major axis, 5.2 AU and qubit, we also get 141. And every planet in our solar system, you can perform this exact same exercise for, and you'll find that its period squared is always going to be equal to its semi-major axis cubed. 
So those are Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. But one thing that's important to remember is that Kepler's laws are purely descriptive. In other words, Kepler had no way of knowing why this was the case. He didn't understand things about gravity or whatever forces would be involved in keeping a planet in its orbit to observe these laws. They were simply descriptive of the data that Tycho had collected. In order to understand the laws of planetary motion at a deeper level and understand the forces of gravity involved, it would literally take a genius to discover those. And we're going to learn about that genius next. <laughs> 